Clean Water Act was amended in 87 to actually cr uh, create the state revolving fund. So since that time, there's been almost $45 billion appropriated from Congress through capitalization grants to the states, and $136 billion in loan agreements have been, have been made. The Safe Drinking Water Act was amended about 10 years later. They decided that um, the Clean Water SRF was working so well that they wanted to go ahead and, and create the same type of thing with the drinking water. And again, you can see about $20 billion in capitalization grants um, and $38 billion in loan agreements. Whoops, sorry. Oh, I lost my mouth. Um, oh, come on. Well, for some reason. Well, this was working fine before. Yeah, looks like we may have lost that screen there. All right. Um, hmm. Okay. So, can I move it to my other screen? What do I do? Yeah, I, I do not know uh, where blue. Hmm. Why is that not working? All right, hold on a second. I've lost everything, Michael. No worries. Just give us a, a brief pause here, guys. We'll be right back with it. Well, shoot. Why is that not working? Can you see this now? Can you see my slides moving at all? Yeah, it's it's moving. Yep. Okay. See okay. So I'll 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 use this. One. I don't know what happened. I got two monitors, and one apparently isn't working anymore. So, um, okay. So the the whole purpose was to replace the old construction grants program. So if you guys have been around long enough, you remember the construction grants program was created after the Clean Water Act was enacted because all these municipalities now had to improve their, um, and actually sometimes create utilities. And so it, it really, the whole intent was for it to be a permanent source of low cost funds for wastewater infrastructure projects. So you're really not supposed to use it as grants. The whole idea was that it was gonna be always there in perpetuity for um, revolving loan funds to be, to be there. Since that time though, Congress has periodically um, said that you have to use some for forgivable loans or for grants. So basically what happens is you have, we get federal capitalization grants uh, appropriated every year from Congress. The amounts vary depending on, again, the whims of Congress. Um, each state has to then provide a 20% state match to, for, that, um, for that. Some states get a direct appropriation from their legislators. States like us, we have to issue bonds. We don't get any money from our legislature. But all that money then goes into this revolving loan fund. Both the drinking water and the clean water work basically the same way. And then the money is loaned out. One of the unique things about it is that all principal and interest has to go back into the fund, which is why they've been able to grow so large. Most loan programs, you know, the interest you can then use for whatever. The revolving loan funds were created um, in EPA, um, and so what they determined was if the interest and principal both went into the fund and had to stay there, they would grow that much larger. So we have to use fees to pay administrative costs. Um, one of the unique things about SRFs for a, from a perspective of a federal program is that the states were given a great deal of uh, flexibility. And so while there are these federal parameters that all programs have to abide by, um, it was actually written into the original regulations that the states were supposed to have a high degree of flexibility. The understanding was is that the water needs in Arizona are not the same water needs as in Iowa or you know, Massachusetts or Florida. And so with that recognition, different states are able to create their programs differently. Um, and so while each state has an SRF, they can be quite different. Um, in Iowa, 
Ours is jointly administered between the um, Iowa Finance Authority, which is what I work with, and our state environmental agency. You can have some states that have the SRF completely run by their environmental agency. You can have states that have water authorities. Arizona has the Water Infrastructure Finance Authority. Oklahoma has an, uh, an authority. Um, Texas has the water, what, Texas Water Development Board. Um, so it's different in the mechanisms that, that each state uses. And for instance, in Iowa, it was written into our enabling statute that the program is jointly administered. So as you can uh, make sense, the DNR does the project eligibility, design approval, all the permitting, um, and then we do all the financial management. So the loans are actually closed and signed by the Iowa Finance Authority. We do all the disbursements, um, we do all the loan servicing, and then we um, uh, do all the bond issues to, um, to leverage. <coughs> Some states leverage their programs, about half of the SRFs leverage their programs with additional tax exempt bonds, um, and about half do not. They just do direct loans. So within this federal framework, there are a couple of things that each state has to do. The projects, all projects have to be on a, have to be on a priority list. They have to be classified in one of EPA's needs serve categories. They have to be scored and they have to be on an intended use plan. The intended use plan, as its name suggests, is how the funds are gonna be used. So all of the projects that are gonna get funded, any of that kind of thing has to, has to be on the intended use plan. That was their mechanism for transparency. Um, also, all SRF projects have to go through a federal environmental review or a a similar state environmental review. They have to have Davis-Bacon, prevailing wages, and American Iron and Steel, um, which is better than the old Buy America because um, it's just for iron and steel, but it's the same idea where all the iron and steel in a project has to be manufactured in the United States. Okay, so within all those federal requirements, though, there's a lot of flexibility. So even though every project can, has to be scored, each state can create its own scoring criteria. Um, again, depending on what the water <coughs> issues are in the state, um, the application requirements can be different. The uh, intended use plan process, like how a project gets on the intended use plan and the timing can be different. Every intended use plan has to be um, published and approved at least annually but it can be more frequently. In Iowa, we do, uh, we update our IUP quarterly so that the projects um, are ready to go. And, and because they only, have, because we do it four times a year, you don't have to have one project that just gets thrown on there um, so it doesn't wanna wait until the following year. Um, obviously, permitting and approval processes can be different. There are federal regs, but then each state can have its own regulations for their permits and approvals and then the loan interest rates and terms. Um, the only thing that the SRF legislation says from a federal level is that the interest rates have to be below market. Um, it doesn't define what that means. It doesn't define market meaning, you know, pick an index. It just says that the interest rates have to be below market. So in 2018, the average clean water interest rate was 1.5% and, and the average drinking water interest rate was 1.6. Um, some states, like our state has a flat interest rate, everybody gets the same interest rate. Some states have different interest rates depending either on maybe um, a poverty level or some other kind of um, criteria. And all of them can be up to 30 year loans um, and then some can be even longer to 40 year loans. Um, and you can get some, um, I think some states have, might have even gone, Indiana might have even gone longer than 40 on some of its stuff. Um, Basic clean water eligibilities are, um, for years and years and years, were just either um, Section 212, publicly owned treatment works. Um, this is, you know, 99%, I think, of all SRF loans are going to be towards publicly owned treatment works um, as defined in 212, which is your permitted uh, municipal wastewater projects. Um, we cannot do private wastewater treatment, so no industries 
um, and no, in my state, CAFOs, no concentrated animal feeding operations. If they're permitted, <coughs> it has to be publicly owned. Then um, also for the implementation of any kind of non-point source pollution control project that's in your state management plan under 319, or, and this is very rarely used, but you can do some projects um, that would be implementing an estuary conservation plan under 320. So Section 212 is what you owned wastewater treatment facilities. So we can do any loan to any kind of, you know, traditional infrastructure, sewer system rehab, anything at the treatment plant, new systems for unsewered communities, and some stormwater management. The one thing that we cannot do is um, operations and maintenance. Um, on the 319 side, that's where you can have either public or private ownership. Um, so as long as it supports whatever your state's non-point source management plan is, we can do both public and private. And then again, the 320, I, don't, I think a few states have done loans under this. We never have. But it would be more things like habitat restoration. <laughs> Um, those types of things. And again, 320 projects can be either publicly or privately owned. Some of the biggest changes um, happened after the, um, with, after the financial crisis when we had um, all that money from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And some of the focus of SRF switched at that time, or not completely switched, but were modified at that time. Um, so there was a much more of an emphasis on things like green infrastructure, water en and energy efficiency, and environmentally innovative projects. Some of this was because of the um, administration at the time and the folks that happened to be at EPA. Um, and as the SRFs have grown and become larger and larger, they are becoming more and more of a focus of Congress. So we are seeing um, since 20. 2009, and then again with the Water Resources Reform and Development Act, the WARDA Act of 2014, um, we're seeing Congress take more interest in the SRFs and at the same time um, inserting themselves more in some of the rules and, and regulations. We were very um, happy to go along our merry way for all those years without their um, involvement, but um, once, once the funds became large, then um, I think it just got more attention. So under WERDA, instead of just those big threes, you know, 212 projects, 319 projects, or 320 projects, they decided to add a bunch of more eligibility. Most of these fall under those three categories anyway. So for instance, you know, decentralized wastewater treatment systems, we always could do on-site systems. We always did in Iowa. You can do those under 319. but they wanted to spell some of these out more, I think, specifically. Um, and again, any kind of projects um, to deal with stormwater, um, water conservation and efficiency, and then Section 122 watershed projects. These, this is a kind of a thing where if you're a municipality and you wanted to do some work upstream in your watershed, the loan has to go to a public entity but you could actually have a project on private land. Um, some of our states, you know, we're, I'm in Iowa, so we have huge ag issues. So we have had some of our municipalities trying to work upstream, both for water quality issues, but also um, flood mitigation issues. Um, and again, uh, any kind of measure to reduce energy consumption is eligible reusing and recycling wastewater, stormwater is all eligible, and then any kind of measures to increase security. So anything to do with security cameras, fencing, any of that kind of stuff. Um, again, not security guards because that's O&M, but um, they just added all these extra eligibilities. Like I said, most of them were already eligible. They just kind of um, specified the yeah, and, and more um, so the detail. So most SRF loans will still be towards public wastewater systems because not all loans can do, can offer loans for all projects. Some states, their enabling statute um, said that, you know, we can only do public 
public link to public entities. Um, and unless they change their statute, then they wouldn't be able to um, do loans to private uh, private borrowers. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that with the SRF, yeah. Pause one second here while I uh, adjust some sound so here. Okay, let's try that there, Lori. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, you know, these are still loans. That's the one thing we have to remember. I mean, we can do a certain amount of forgivable. Um, sometimes it's 10% of the CAP grant. Sometimes it's 20% of the CAP grant. But the vast majority of these projects are going to be loans. And what we always tell our folks is that if the project is going to improve water quality, it's probably eligible. Um, and again, if it's going to increase, enhance resiliency of some sort um, or security, it's going to be eligible. And we're seeing more and more loans trying to deal with um, stormwater. So that's the clean water side. The drinking water side is much more straightforward. <laughs> it doesn't deal with non-point source. Drinking water loans are really for loans for improvements to community water systems. So we can do consolidations and connections, transmission distribution, treatment storage, all the very, you know, what I would consider traditional drinking water um, projects. The, one, the few things that are spelled out very specific in the uh, enabling statute as you cannot do dams and reservoirs um, and projects that are primarily for fire protection we can't do. Now, if you have a water pressure issue, and, oh, by the way, it will also help fire protection. That's, that's okay. But it can't be solely for fire protection. And it can't be for speculative growth. So if you're in a municipality and you want to run your utilities out to some bare ground in hopes that you get a developer to, you know, create a subdivision or a commercial um, facility, you know, you can't do it with SRF. That's, that's too speculative. The one big thing with SRF that's a different thing or I'm sorry, with the drinking water SRF that's different than the clean water is the use of the set-asides from the capitalization grant. So on the clean water side, you can take 4% of the cap grant for admin expenses and then also obviously fees that you charge. On the drinking water side, you can take up the 31% of the cap grant in a variety of different set-asides, some for admin, some specifically for technical assistance and capacity development, for your state drinking water program and for source water protection. So a lot of times you'll see your drinking water, um, whatever environmental entity in your state does drinking water, a lot of those staff members may be paid by the drinking water cap grant. Um, again, some states, like for instance, our in, in Iowa, both the drinking water and the wastewater are regulated by our Department of Natural Resources. But you'll, you'll see a lot of states where maybe the wastewater is regulated by the, their environmental agency and the drinking water is regulated by the health department. Um, it's, well, every, you know, you add more agencies and it could be more complicated and your drinking water and wastewater programs may be run completely differently. They aren't that way in Iowa. So for us, it's a little bit, it's a little bit simpler. So having said all that, with all those kind of different um, scenarios, I'll talk just briefly about some of the stuff that we do. Um, in Iowa, we're, we are able to fund any eligible project. So again, it, it helps because we can tell folks that are not ready to have their project on the intended use plan to go back and work on it and get through some of the design and permitting issues with the Department of Natural Resources because before they get on the IUP because if you are eligible, you will, you will get funding. There are a lot of states that, that are not able to do that. They, um, they don't have enough money to fund all the eligible projects, and so there is a cutoff, and, and so, you know, the scoring is much more important in those states. Um, we have done loans as large as $76 million for Ames for a new drinking water treatment plant. Ames is the home of Iowa State University, big Iowa-Iowa State game this Saturday, go clones. 
Um, we've also done a $74 million project for Dubuque's new wastewater treatment plant. But our average loan is $2 million because, as you can imagine, in Iowa, we are a state full of very small communities. We have 835 communities with an MPDS permit. 588 of those have populations less than 1,000. So more so on the wastewater side, of course, we do have about 15 rural water districts that, that sometimes we borrow, uh, will borrow from us and sometimes from USDA. But this is just a map. So we've covered most of the state of Iowa. This is a little outdated. This is from 2017, but um, almost, almost all communities in the state have begun to borrow from the SRF. We have done, since its beginning in 80, I think our first loan was right around 1990, um, 3.5 billion, and our current loan portfolio is um, 1.9 billion. And you can see we have begun doing more and more non-point source projects. Um, Iowa does not have a water quantity issue. In fact, we have too much water. If you've been reading about the flooding that we seem to have on a regular basis, but we do have a serious water quality problem. Um, Iowa is probably the number one contributor to the Gulf hypoxia zone. You're welcome. Um, so we are trying to do more and more of those types of projects to deal with the water quality issues. Um, the other thing that we do in Iowa is we have 0% planning and design loans for up to three years with no payments. This is to enable our smaller communities, well, any community, but it was initiated to help some of our smaller communities uh, have a source of funding to hire a consulting engineer. The thought of, you know, some of our municipalities paying thirty to $40,000 for an a, uh, engineer to do the design, um, they, just, they just wouldn't do it, right? They, they just wouldn't get off the dime. So this was giving, this is an incentive for them. They knew they had to do something. Um, it was an incentive for them to hire a consulting engineer, figure out what was going on, and hopefully not wait until they were under some kind of a compliance schedule with the state before they actually did anything. It's been wildly successful. Um, you don't have to use an SRF const uh, construction and permanent loan if you use one of our planning and design loans. We just want you to get the project done. Um, so they have used USDA or other um, sources of financing. But if they go, do go with SRF, then it just the planning and design loan just gets rolled into their SRF loan. Our current interest rate is 1.75 for 20 years, 275 for 30 years. We do have, again, a quarter percent servicing fee to pay admin staff. Um, so the all-in rate's 2% for 20 years for our uh, municipalities. If you are considered disadvantaged, then we do allow that 175 for 30 years. We don't have a reserve requirement for our borrowers. Um, and our debt service coverage is 110. Those of you who borrow in the public market know that obviously you would have a reserve requirement, maybe 10% or more, um, and your debt service coverage would be significantly more than 110 depending on your rating. We also co-fund a lot with CDBG. Um, and again, projects can use our planning and design loan to get ready um, with any financing source. Um, and we actually meet Quarterly, the CDBG is actually run out of a different department. Our Economic Development Authority runs CDBG, has a, allocates CDBG. Obviously, USDA or D is out of USDA's office, and then um, SRF is both Iowa Finance Authority and DNR. And those agencies meet on a quarterly basis to talk about projects that are coming up and um, try and coordinate. Some projects are better fit for USDA. They have a lot more grant funds. Um, than either CDBG or us sometimes, so um, that kind of coordination is helpful. We do, like I mentioned before, a lot of non-point source program loans for a state revolving fund. Obviously, the vast majority of our fund is still in, in municipal infrastructure, but we'll do either direct loans or loan participations, and, some, and we have a big link deposit um, program for our ag BMPs. We've done landfill closures, habitat and wetland restoration, brownfield cleanups, lake restoration. We have done a Superfund site, a lot of green infrastructure. Um, and again, for a non-point source, you can be both a public or a private entity to borrow. Um, 
one of the things that we've found as we do more and more green infrastructure, you know, for a lot of municipalities, this is a flood control or a stormwater control kind of a process, project. Um, for us, um, flood mitigation is huge, but we have to look at it from the SRF side. We have to look at it as a water quality benefit. And so as long as there's a water quality benefit, um, we can fund it. Somebody put me on hold. How dare they? <laughs> um, um, so one of the things that we found is with some of our municipalities that the downtown businesses kind of love these permeable paving, bioretention, rain garden things because it leads towards a more beautiful, more of a beautification project. I mean, for our purposes, right, we, we worry about the water quality um, benefit, but when you have curb cutouts that are running into uh, tree planters and rain gardens and stuff, um, not only does it reduce the puddles in front of their stores, but it also, you know, you got trees growing in downtown and all that. So it's interesting that downtown businesses um, you know, like these kind of projects more so maybe for, for completely different purposes, but that's fine, we don't care. We also did a big stream daylighting project in Dubuque, um, and we do do a lot of ag BMPs. So uh, we do a lot of erosion control projects with terraces and buffer strips and manure management projects. Um, as long as they are smaller, non-permitted livestock facilities. Right? So we cannot do over 1,000 animal units, those concentrated animal feeding operations, they're a point source. But we do, all, we do a lot of smaller, um, smaller sources. We've done some wetland restoration. Um, I'm sure there are people in the state that want us to do a lot more. The north, specifically the northwestern part of the state, which has probably the best uh, most fertile land in the world used to be full of prairie potholes and wetlands. Um, and then it was all drained for farming. And then those drainage tiles, um, you know, are basically a conduit for all sorts of nutrients going into our streams and rivers and ultimately the Gulf. So we have been successful in um, financing some wetland restoration um, in some of those areas. Um, probably land that shouldn't have been farmed in the first place, but with enough tile, you can drain almost anything. Um, I'm gonna just switch gears now and talk briefly about the fact that we have done green bonds. Iowa's uh, SRF has issued green bonds since 2015. We've done four of them. We issue anywhere between every 12 to 18 months. Um, and one of the kind of the, things that, that folks in SRF world have said for a while is that we've been issuing green bonds since the very beginning. We just didn't call them green because there wasn't anything called green bonds. But all of our projects comply with either the Clean Water Act or the Safe Drinking Water Act, right? They either improve water quality, protect the environment, or protect public health. So we, we don't have to go through a lot of um, machinations to get any kind of a green designation. It's kind of obvious. And when we decided to do green bonds, there were really two factors. One, we wanted to see if we could attract new investors, right? More demand um, keeps our prices low. And that we also, the compliance couldn't be too difficult. We didn't want to add a lot of complexity because we're already AAA. So if it was going to be a lot of um, difficulty, then it, we didn't think it was going to be worth it. So the way that our program works is we have already originated our loans, um, and then we use the bond proceeds to repay ourselves, basically, for the disbursements we've made to those projects. So we already have the list of projects that are going to get financed. Um, that There's nothing you know, speculative about it. We know most of them, they would have all probably um, started construction, had some disbursements, some of them, depending on the timing of the bond issue, may actually even be completed. So we were able to put into the official statement just the second exhibit, which listed all the projects that were funded, the amount that they were funded, the description of the project, and the total amount. It just looks something like this. 
And so we, you know, we were able to pull it from the information we obviously already had for these projects. And our descriptions are pretty short. Um, I've seen some descriptions from SR, other SRFs, um, which they go into like a paragraph. Ours are pretty brief, and nobody has seemed to be concerned that they didn't get, you know, specificity on what kind of treatment improvements. I'm not sure bond issuers or bond purchasers would care if it was a new clarifier or a new trickling filter, right? So that's, you know, the, the compliance wasn't that bad as far as when we went out to market. And then every SRF has to provide an annual report to EPA every year. And in that annual report, it talks about the projects that have closed, um, the projects that have been done construction, the projects that have completed, all the projects that, you know, signed loan docs and all that kind of stuff, which is the other part of the compliance, the ongoing compliance that you, that you hear about when you look at, um, when you look at green bonds and what kind of compliance. And since we already did that in the annual report, it was determined that we didn't have to do any more reporting. So for us, there wasn't that additional compliance. I know some SRFs have had concerns about um, the additional compliance that would be required, and just because of the way our program works and some of the stuff that we put in our annual report, um, that just wasn't an issue. This final slide is something that one of our investment bankers, Greg Schwartz with Piper Jaffrey, put together. And he, you know, we've always, been curious about whether we're getting better pricing, um, having our bonds uh, labeled as green. Uh, there's some discussion out there about whether there's really an impact or not. Um, we went ahead, again, to go ahead and designate our bonds as green because it was really quite easy. We didn't have to do a lot of heavy lifting. But it's really difficult nowadays to see your retail buyers. It's difficult to see if there's any specific green um, investors unless it's really, really obvious. Um, a lot of the big investment firm or investment pools might even have a, some, you know, green portion of it, and you might not be able to see that. So what he did was he looked at all SRF bonds that have been issued since 2014. Um, all of these SRFs are AAA rated and they're all tax exempt. Um, for a long time, you know, the market for green bonds was in Europe and the tax exemption doesn't do those folks any, any good. Um, and the tax exemption for us was way more beneficial than any kind of differential from green or non-green. Um, so he looked at um, every SRF issue and the red line are, are the SRF um, programs that have had the highest price uh, based on MMD. So you can see that middle line is MMD. And they were maybe 20 plus basis points over MMD um, and that final one. And then the yellow line are the SRF bonds that have priced best. So some of them are even below, right, 20 some basis points below MMD. And then MMD is the, is the um, dotted line, the black dotted line. So then he, out of that total pool, he pulled out the green and the non-green bonds. So the green bonds, that's the, that's the green line. Um, and then the non-green bonds is the gray line. And so over time, he has, you know, he has shown or is showing that there is a slight pricing benefit to green. Um, it's probably not massive, he, you know, it's about five basis points below MMD uh, versus maybe, you know, a little above, but, um, you know, he's pretty convinced that while you can't always see it um, in your investors necessarily because so many of them are, are buried, uh, you know, you can't really see retail investors anymore, um, that there is a, a, price, benefic a, pr a price benefit to, um, to doing green bonds. Um, that's all I got, so I'm happy to answer any questions out there.
Michael, have we had any questions? Lori, am I coming through? Now you are. Gosh. Well, I apologize for that, guys. Yeah, again, uh, getting used to WebEx myself. Well, I do have actually, I do have a question for you. Uh, let's say that there's a project that's going across state lines and SRFs for each state are being utilized. Is that a scenario that could really play out? Um, yeah, it could. We haven't really seen one. Uh, we do have to stop at the, at the you know, at, at the border, um, but we could, we could potentially do one that cross, I don't know if that happens very often. Um, I know that in Sioux City, you know, their wastewater treatment plant, they have some uh, discharge into the Missouri River, and so they did have to go into the Missouri River and we had to deal with EPA because that was out of our jurisdiction. But I suppose it, yeah. The other thing I, I should mention is when you say that cross state lines, those are some of the projects that we're seeing in WIFIA some of the large regional mm -hmm. projects. Right. And SRF can be used with WIFIA. WIFIA will pay, I think it's 49% of the project cost, and we're seeing that the state's SRF programs are sometimes picking up that 51%. Is there anything right now, because we talk a lot about um, having to sort of be at the behest of, of lawmakers and Congress and if something that's going to go through the appropriations process and whatnot. But is there any legislation or policy that is not tied directly to funding that is people are watching right now and in terms of SRF? What we really would what we would really like to see is some reduction in the regulations. Um, you know, of the last we never we didn't have Davis Bacon prevailing wages until 2010. We didn't have American Iron and Steel until um, I can't remember, 20, I don't know, I'm going to say 2014 or 15. So they just keep throwing on more and more regulations. We now have certain states um, that do direct loans have to do fiscal sustainability plans for their borrowers. I mean, our argument has always been, if this is a good public policy, then it should be on everybody. It shouldn't just be on SRFs because they don't have to use us, right? So if, if, it's a, if, it's, if asset management is good public policy, put it on the MPDS permits. Don't put it on SRF. So that's kind of where our fight is now. We've been fortunate in that infrastructure is very popular, and so our funding has even increased in the last couple of years. But they, again, they just keep seeing this as this giant funding source, and so they just keep throwing more and more regulations on it. SRFs are federal funds when they want them to be federal funds, and they're state funds when they don't want them to be federal funds. So, for instance, matching with STAG grants and WIFIA, SRFs are considered non-federal, but Davis-Bacon, right. AIS, all these other kinds of things, then we're federal. Right. You mentioned before um, private business not ever, you know, being a part of, of developing out utilities or, or what have you, or, or just being too involved early on in the process. Is that something, uh, what's the chicken and egg there? Did the private business, is there an appetite? Do they regularly think like, hey, let's approach those who manage SRFs and, and see if there's a way we can do a business development thing together or, or what exactly is the atmosphere with the private business um, from their end, I guess? Like, are they really, you know, do they run into that where they're looking to get their hands or, or get, use out of SRF funds? A little bit. I mean, you know, obviously um, our environmental, or I'm sorry, our economic development folks that are trying to pull in business would, would like to be able to fund a lot of stuff. What we can do is if you have a business that's coming into town and is causing you to increase the capacity of your municipal system, that we can fund because it's actually the improvements in the, are being done to the municipal system. But for instance, if they needed, if they, you know, we've got, on, uh, hot, say you've got a hog facility or, or a, you know, a hog slaughtering facility, they have got a lot of pretreatment. They sometimes have on-site uh, wastewater issues. We can't fund them on-site, but if they are discharging um, ultimately to the municipal wastewater facility and you need to increase your capacity, 
we can fund those types of projects. So, you know, it's it's not a it's an indirect, I guess, benefit to the utility or to the industry. Yeah. Well. Well, Lori, uh, thank you so much for for presenting on SRS today and and giving your time. Again, I, I can't tell you um, how requested this topic has been to go over SRS. I mean, it should not be a shocker. Our people simply want to have as much resources as, as humanly possible. Um, I would like to uh, have this recording made available in about a week or so, just so you know, Lori. Um, we'll have the PowerPoint sent around and a follow-up email for uh, the UFF in the next week or so. Uh, and of course, uh, to everyone out there, uh, please send me any follow-up questions that might occur to you later. You know, it's, it's my job to facilitate with our presenters so I can talk with Lori if there's a resource uh, elsewhere we can tap to, to get you taken care of, uh, what have you there. Uh, but beyond that, I really appreciate you guys uh, checking in. Uh, we will be resuming, you know, more monthly contact now that summer is over from the UFF. Uh, you can even perhaps expect to hear from me in a phone call just to kind of canvas and, and see exactly uh, where everybody's at uh, with, with their own expectations for the UFF uh, and what they might like to see. Just, again, always trying to cast the, uh, the widest net possible for, for learning how we can help you guys. But uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in, and uh, we will be in touch, and you can expect the recording of this in about a week or so. Right. Thank you again, Lauren.